<laughs> I have Tell me to why. figure this out here. There we go. Much better. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Are you the core commander? Sure. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm a professor here at the Party School of Global Studies and welcome to our second Beyond the Headlines. Uh, today, or as, as my, well, you, I, I'll, I'll let you keep your joke. Um, today we're discussing, <laughs> today we're discussing multiple dimensions of, of the Ukraine war. Uh, here at the Party School, we really pride ourselves on being able to take multifaceted looks at different problems and to create multifaceted solutions. And so we're gonna look at this war the way a lot of folks do and through its security dimensions, but obviously this war has had global implications. And like we do through our curriculum and looking at uh, history, economics and, and real world practice, uh, that's what we're gonna bring with you today. We're talking about this war, we're gonna look at it from its actual tactics and what's going on within the war but we're also gonna look at how it's impacting the rest of the world and how the rest of the world views it. And we're not just gonna sit here and talk to you. We wanna have a global conversation, both with those of you who are in the room and those of you who are out there in, uh, uh, in the virtual, virtual world. Um, today, we look at Putin's war in Ukraine through a variety of angles. It's now lasted over 200 days. And just as it started to look like it might look in Ukraine's favor, Putin is working to step up conventional forces and is threatened to use nuclear weapons. The head of the Russian Orthodox Church says Russian soldiers who die in the battlefield will have their sins absolved and the sacrifice washes away all their sins. Today I'm joined with four of my excellent colleagues uh, who will look at this conflict through a multitude of lenses. Let me introduce them all right now and then we can get right to it. First, we've got Jack Weinstein. Uh, he's a professor of practice of international security. He was a, he's a retired Lieutenant General of the United States, excuse me, Lieutenant General of the United States Air Force. He served in the Air Force from 1982 to 2018. Prior to arriving at the Party School, he was Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration, headquarters of the United States Air Force in the Pentagon. In this position, he was responsible for the Secretary and Chief of Staff on all aspects of nuclear deterrence operations uh, providing direction, guidance, integration, and advocacy regarding the nuclear deterrence mission of the United States Air Force. And he engaged with joint interagency and NATO for nuclear enterprise solutions. Then we'll be, uh, we also have Kaya Shilda, who's the Jean Monnet Chair in European Security and Defense and Associate Professor of International Relations here and the Director of the, the Center for the Study of Europe. Her book, The Political Economy of European Security, investigates the state society relations between the United States, excuse me, the European Union and interest groups with particular focus on security and defense institutions, as well as industries and markets. Also, we'll be joined by Minya. She's an associate professor of international relations here at the Party School. Her publications uh, include a, a groundbreaking book called The Belt Road and Beyond, State Mobilized Globalization in China. Uh, she's also the author of some key journal articles that are that uh, things to talk about today, such as the Thucydides trap, clash of globalizations and divided peace, great power, po great power politics uh, from the TPP to the BRI, and China and competing cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Finally, we'll be joined by Ambassador Jorge Heine. Uh, he's a research professor here at the Party School, and Ambassador Jorge Heine is a lawyer, an international relations scholar, and a diplomat with a special interest in the international politics of the global south. He served as an ambassador of Chile, his native Chile, to China, to India, and to South Africa. He's also the past vice president of the International Political Science Association. And he has two brand new great books. This guy is very, uh, very, uh, very prolific. Um, one called Xi Na in the, in the Century of the Dragon, What Everyone Should Know About China. And another one called Active Non-Alignment for Latin America. I'll kick this off by asking each of my colleagues a question, and they're only going to take about five minutes to answer those questions, and then we can open it up to all of you folks and have a uh, have a global conversation. So I'll start with uh, with with Jack Weinstein. Um, yesterday, actually, the president of the Ukraine did a virtual webinar with students at Harvard, and he said that uh, 
uh, he gave a lot of advice about, about leadership, but he expressed real concern that Putin is not bluffing on nuclear, on, on the nuclear option that he is threatening with. And he said, yes, he thinks that the uh, United States has really stepped up recently, but we failed to prevent the invasion of the Ukraine. And he asked us, and I'll ask you, Jack, uh, what will the United States do uh, and the European community and the world community do to prevent Putin from going to the nuclear option and give us some background? Thanks, Kevin. So let me take a broad look when I look at this question. First thing I wanna bring up though, for everybody that has friends or family members or that are watching, uh, we hope they're safe with Florida because that looks like an extremely nasty storm that's gonna hit. So my thoughts and prayers are out to everybody. Um, you know, we talk about how we're in, and I'm going to keep this to five minutes. We talk about how we're in this uh, uh, war for over 270 days with Ukraine, but that's inaccurate. Um, this war started in 2014. And if the first lesson to learn is if there's a problem in the international community, if there is a problem in your company, problems don't, they just fester. They do not go away. So when you look at the way the world behaved with the invasion of Crimea, Look at what Russia did in Estonia, Georgia, before they got to Crimea. Um, we should have been doing much more preparedness than we have done, uh, looking like we got caught off guard with the invasion in Ukraine. The second point, from a military standpoint, our view of Ukraine, I think, was really clouded at the beginning. It was clouded because of the way the Afghanistan withdrawal went, and we saw the implosion of the Afghan army. So... There was a view, if you listen to the pundits, that the Ukrainian army was not going to stand up to the Russians. And then we had the view that the Russians were this invincible force. And what we've learned from this Russian invincible force is they are not invincible at all. And I will get into that point in a minute. Um, also, Russia did not learn from history. Anyone that's a, a military history fan will study World War I, and you'll study the von Schlieffen plan. And a look about that was World War I, the hook that the Germans were going to do. They're going to come through Belgium. And what happened? The Germans um, outran their supply chain. Well, if you look at exactly what happened to the Russians, the Russians did the exact same thing. And the Russian military operates very different than the U.S. and Western military. We give orders and expect people to think very much decentralized. And for the United States military, it is that enlisted level that is actually running it. And in the Russian, it's a hierarchy that is driven down. And if you look at the Ukrainians, they have been very successful, uh, very successful at uh, killing Russian generals. Uh, I wanna talk about the 300 person call up, 300,000. By the way, that has been another disaster for them. Uh, people don't wanna die for their country when they don't see a need to die for their country. So if the one thing we can do to help um, Ukraine has probably provided more 747s to go into Moscow to fly more young Russians out of the country. But I just want to go through a few things. If you're going to call up 300,000 people, I want to put this in U.S. terms. In the United States, we take someone off the streets and to, we make them soldiers. And we do that by sending them to basic training for 10 weeks. And then we send them to advanced individual training anywhere from four to 52 weeks. And then we send them to ranger school, which is, like, which is about 61 or 62 days. So if you're taking people in the Russian military, by the way, they don't have leadership now, and putting them in the Russian military because they had a little bit of training, that 300,000 force is a weak 300,000 force going up against people that are getting to be extremely well-trained and they're fighting um, for their country. So calling someone up doesn't make anybody a soldier. Um, and the final item I want to just briefly talk about is nuclear use. What is concerning now is I just don't want to throw aside a bluff from uh, Vladimir Putin that he's bluffing using nuclear weapons because I believe if you're going to talk about nuclear use, you need to talk about working with a stable platform, stable individual. And I'm not sure the individual is that stable right now, but what it concerns me and we can go into this more in question and answer is, we know the vote that is in the regions that Russia wants to take over is a sham. But if he call, if they are declared part of the Russian Federation, 
Does he believe attacks on the Russian Federation then are an existential threat against his country and he's gonna react differently? What really needs to happen that has not happened is the president of the United States has been uh, pretty focused as of late, not at the very beginning, but as of late on the threat of using nuclear weapons that the United States will not tolerate it. I think it would have been a lot stronger if the president of the United States made those comments with the NATO secretary general standing next to him. So it was a unified force of NATO, which the US provides nuclear weapons to, as well as the, um, uh, the president of the United States saying it. So I wanna get into nuclear discussion a little bit later in the conversation, but I wanna give time to my colleagues so I do not violate my five minute rule. Kevin. Hey, we just wanna make it a global conversation. Let's, let's move to Europe and, and talk to Professor Shulda. Uh, in 2008, after the global financial crisis, it looked like the European Union had a lot of agency, right? They, the ECB, the EU, the European Commission sat right at the middle and took on their took on their, their own crisis, right? The IMF was there at the table, but the United States was far in the background. Here, decade later, in the middle of a war, where's the European agency? The, uh, the United States seems to be at the head of the table once again. Should we be surprised about that? What does it say about European security and how is European security policy being, being heard or, or formulated within with this environment? Thank you, Kevin. So, that question was the one I was preparing to think about answering last week. I was thinking about European strategy, the strategic role of the European Union, the military role of the European Union, and that kind of cohesion. But the joke that I said earlier is that um, instead of behind the headlines, it's more like keeping up with the headlines. I changed what I wanted to talk about three or four times over the last five days based on the headlines. And so I will get to that to answer that question kind of um, at the end of uh, three or four points I want to make. So the after looking at the news, especially yesterday, the news, which I'm going to get to about the pipeline explosion, what I thought would be really helpful um, to kind of bring to the table as a concept is this idea of the weaponization of, of civilian or economic networks. Um, so this uh, this is something that we've observed happening in the last 20 years, the fact that there can be things like markets, civilian markets or um, Internet uh, um, companies or services uh, that 20 years ago, IR theory, international relations theory and and experts thought would bring the world closer together. And the liberal prediction around that was that these kind of networks, markets, uh, communications technologies would bind the world closer together. Well, hegemons like the United States have actually used those networks because they um, coexist with them. Uh, financial power is based in the United States and New York, uh, and uh, so is communications and internet technology power, and has used those things to as a tool of statecraft. Okay, so this is an observation that has been made by some scholars that really problematizes um, liberal understandings of the world, the idea that a world knitted together would be less prone to conflict, okay? So the three things I wanted to talk about really quickly is what does this weaponization um, of networks mean um, in this conflict? What do we see? Um, and then what does this mean for EU politics and for the EU itself? Um, and so these, these, like I said, the, the innovator of weaponizing networks has been the United States. But right behind it as a reaction has been the Russian Federation. And so, for example, in reaction to the Magnitsky Act and sanctions on Russian elites for human rights abuses in 2012, the Russian Federation uh, weaponized the networks it could, which were actually human networks of adoptions, stopped adoptions to US parents. Okay, so multiple states are in this game. Multiple states use the networks they're controlling, the resources. Uh, Russia also kind of, I think, I don't wanna say learned from that, but also uh, explicitly uh, weaponized refugee flows, knowing the European Union has a draconian and hypocritical migration and border security policy, um, was, was helping um, uh, an ally in Syria anyway, but a side effect that Russian strategists talked about and the Russian government talked about was indiscriminate bombings and targeting of civilians 
help supercharge migration flows towards Europe, exposing these European hypocrisies. So the victims were Syrians, but the weaponization was also against Europe. We saw this last year with the uh, plot to get Kurds to fly to Belarus and try to push them over the border to, um, to Poland, which was a actual plot to weaponize migrants. So the migrants are the victims, but the targets the European Union. Um, and so one thing is, is the actor or the subject of the weaponization has a choice. So for example, when Ukrainians started flow, uh, coming out of Ukraine into the European Union, the EU flipped a switch and gave the Ukrainians temporary protected status, which they had not given any other group before, making their flows less visible, less conflictual, less of a human security crisis. Okay, so um, a couple other things I want to mention in this weaponization, agriculture. There's been a lot of headlines. I'm trying to give a behind the headlines a comment. There's been a lot of headlines about the, the crisis of grain and agriculture flowing out of Ukraine or being stopped from flowing out of Ukraine. And uh, a lot of these headlines might make people think that that's just an effective war. No, it was an actual weaponization of food supply chains by naval blockade from Russia, okay? Um, and this is not light stuff. I have some statistics, I can go back to it, but um, the, uh, I have a list of places, Syria, Lebanon, Tunisia, Somalia, and Libya, um, and Eritrea, all at least relying 50% of their wheat coming from Ukraine. And inflationary prices in the form of 50% to 100% in these places of these food supply. Now, I might be coming at kind of going into the topics my, my colleagues are talking about, but two things to watch in this space. One is the agreement that resolved this between Turkey, Ukraine, and Russia to monitor ships going in and out of the Black Sea is expiring on November 1st. And from what we've seen yesterday in the headlines about the pipelines, I don't know if I would expect a renewal of that. So there's going to be a new crisis of that. Also, Ukraine's grain is being exported far more slowly than before, not because of states, but because of markets, because shipping companies are hesitant. Insurers are putting a pretty high premium on this because there's still concern, security concerns in the Black Sea. And then back to the weaponization of this against the EU by Russia, um, Putin has said last week in the headlines that the EU is acting like neocolonial powers and choking the global south of its food supply, saying that even after this, only 3% of the grain coming out of Ukraine is going to the global south, where the UN says it's more like 30%. So this is a narrative that's being weaponized. So moving on to energy. Um, the thing I was going to talk about then, even before yesterday, is that winter is coming and people who watch um, energy supply, European energy markets are incredibly anxious about what's going to happen, both practically materially and also politically as a result of energy shocks this winter. So there's varying um, dependence on Russian energy and Russian gas in particular. Um, Italy actually uh, only is about 10% dependent on Russian gas. So I guess any further shocks in Italy politically will be um, modified. Um, but states like Germany and also Eastern European states are heavily dependent on Russian gas. So back to the weaponization frame, um, over the last few weeks, Gazprom has been accidentally shutting off the supply for maintenance um, multiple times over the last few uh, weeks which is provoking a lot of um, early hysteria. And that was even before yesterday. Yesterday was supposed to be the day, the news headline yesterday was supposed to be that there was a new pipeline from Norway to Poland. That was supposed to be the news headline until, and I didn't even see this until I got home late last night, there were two leaks or three leaks on the Nord Stream pipelines that were confirmed to be explosions of unknown source but um, in international waters at a diving depth um, and um, very unlikely accident, very likely a state-based actor. So the implications here are huge. At a minimum, it means all this kind of gaslighting, so to speak, of, oh, the, 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 the pipelines are on, no, they're off, no, they're on, no, they're off, and, and different little things means they're off. That's it. I mean, there's one other pipeline going through um, Ukraine and um, just yesterday, um, the Russian foreign ministry said, maybe that one will also be shut down too. So 
um, our inference about state-based actors, well, there are two possible state-based actors, I think, and I could get pulled into conspiracy, conspiracy theory one way or the other, but one state-based actor has been messing with the pipelines and is continuing to. Um, but the bigger thing, actually, about this is that this has become instantly securitized. The pipelines were sabotaged by a state-based actor. So that means that all these alternate sources of energy that you're scrambling for, liquid national, natural gas terminals, other pipelines are also vulnerable if someone's blowing up pipelines. It's now become actually weaponized. Um, should I save the rest about European politics in the EU? Let's save the rest for, okay. for the conversation yeah. with, uh, with other folks. And let's so uh, let me just signal for questions. I wanted to pivot. I, I'm, like I said, I'm just trying to keep up with the headlines. But I kind of wanted to pivot to talking about what this means for European politics, like what happened this weekend with a neo-fascist party being elected, and to actually finally answer Professor Gallagher's question about what this means for the EU yeah. and what the EU's role is. So Hundreds just to give questions. a hint. What does it mean for climate change, yeah. given the fact that Europe exactly. used to be the, the leaders of that? Let's move to China, where there's no shortage of questions. Uh, and Professor Ye, you know, the, this much, must have much touted special alliance between China and Russia mm -hmm. appeared to have some strain when, when President Xi went to, went to the Russian Federation recently. What are the limits of, uh, of China's support for, for Russia in this war? And, and how is China positioning itself globally in this, in this new chess game? And you're a real expert on, what, on, 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 on the home front in China. And what, how is this playing out at home? Thank you, and uh, thanks for organizing these events. And uh, I'm delighted to share this stage with my dear colleagues. Um, so China is not part of the Ukraine war, but it feels like the US also hasn't really directly fought on the Ukraine uh, 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 land. Uh, but it feels like the Ukraine war has been uh, taking off as a conflict between China and the United States. So I will um, uh, struck my remark along this big geopolitical showdown between China and the US with the Ukraine war as a, as, as a turning point. Uh, and I totally agree with my colleague Jack and the origin of China as a, uh, alignment with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia uh, is much longer and uh, it's, it's a longer story than, the, than this ongoing war. So now um, coming back to China and the Ukraine war, it, the, the war uh, created a profound dilemma to China's domestic and foreign policy. On the one hand, the Chinese were very sympathetic with Russia before and at the outset of uh, the, the invasion. Their rationale was that NATO and the US uh, had uh, uh, increasingly pressured the insecurity issues on Russia and they failed. So most of us actually, you know, we take international events to your own experience, right? The Chinese fail. Uh, they, they, they have been subject to this increasing security pressure from the West uh, over the years. So when the war broke out, the Chinese, um, a lot of the Chinese and including official and online uh, commentaries, basically it says, this is how it happens when you push the, uh, a great power too much and you push and push eventually they, they, um, uh, they, invade, they, they fought. But uh, um, so that's what I say, it's a dilemma because China had for decades, while the international norm, they truly educate and accept and think of as a secret rule of, of international system is sovereignty. Um, because they uh, genuinely uh, believe that sovereignty was the, the, the change in the international system that allowed China to claim independence and, uh, and the territorial integrity and, and, and reinforcing its claims on domestic affairs and, uh, and Taiwan. Right? So sovereignty is really important to China's foreign policy. 
So, so uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is a sovereign nation, creates a, a, a huge moral dilemma for the Chinese um, uh, uh, audience. So what can they do? Right? They feel they, are, they understood Russia's sense of insecurity, but on the other hand, they feel troubled about Russia's invasion. So what do we, we, um, the, uh, what, what do we observe is a kind of middle ground that China's uh, official positioning uh, and policy uh, eventually took, that is the stressing sovereignty as this, this important international norm, but refraining from criticizing Russia. And so this has become uh, a, a, a kind of accepted uh, uh, position uh, uh, of China over Ukraine. And then the, how the war was fought. Uh, other than the military aspects, this war was fought using a lot of non-military uh, weapons. Right? So my uh, colleague Kaya mentioned this weaponization of or agriculture interdependence or dependence, right? Um, and, and China saw uh, how the, 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 uh, the, the West using economic sanctions uh, and intelligence that can deliver extremely deadly impact on, on, on Russia. So on the one hand, they, they want to see Russia be stronger, more resilient, uh, but they, they also are very, um, the, they I refer to Chinese uh, companies, investors, and, and government, they feel vulnerable uh, uh, to potential secondary sanctions, right? And they want to help Russia, but they're also worried about this, this collective sanctions against um, Russia. So uh, what they uh, opted for is another middle ground policy, right? So the they China, uh, refrain from uh, military assistance, uh, active financial aid to Russia, but they continued trading with Russia so that Russia's economy more or less can be uh, can be stable. Uh, and and then, uh, so this is uh, how China and uh, uh, and the the Ukraine war. What I saw as a uh, um, most dangerous in terms of China-US uh, uh, competition, however, is not in the Ukraine war. Rather, it's the war created dynamics within China um, that uh, the Chinese state society and the elites are much more acceptable and uh, uh, to, uh, to prepare uh, for a potential military conflict without the, with the United States. So before the, the, the Ukraine war, most of Chinese was, uh, did not anticipate like in their lifetime or uh, in the foreseeable future that there might be an actual military conflict uh, involving, um, uh, uh, involving China. But now they feel this is war is very close to home. So there are, there are two, there are a couple of dynamics. One is the Chinese strategists, uh, very well regarded inside China and outside China. So they did a lot of simulations and historical tracing, and they 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 they, they uh, conclude that the the the, the U.S. Um, induced uh, Russia into uh, in, into invasion. So this sounds like a very um, uh, thoughty logic, but what do they, they have the, the, the premises that the strategies tend to think American uh, um, security establishment as a military actor. Right? So, 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 so they have this um, different uh, pathways. So game theory have different pathways. So at every moment of a critical crisis or turning point, if the US were serious about stopping Russia from invading, they should do one, two, three. Right? And, uh, and, 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 and the US didn't do the one, two, three, and thus Russia opted for the pathway that over time uh, led to the invasion. But that's less uh, important. So the more important lesson for, for, for China uh, is that um, 
uh, they are vulnerable to the same kind of strategic manipulation um, uh, that will make Ch China uh, do, uh, make these missteps and, uh, and conduct a premature military action, and we know where, like Taiwan. Uh, so they uh, then observe how the war was fought and they realized military advantage. So over the Taiwan um, situation, China's military advantage over Taiwan was really dominant. It's very, it, it's just uh, um, uh, in no comparison, right? Uh, uh, but then the, the Chinese uh, observe the U uh, Ukraine war being fought and uh, realize that the war is not just about military. It's about information, finance, digital uh, technology. It's, it's a whole package. And the US has much, much bigger package with its allies and, and, and hegemonic uh, dominance over the years. So they, they think they are not ready and they are more vulnerable than, than the, the opponent. Uh, so this uh, um, uh, uh, in the so that's where I say that the Chinese is is in the process kind of accepting and preparing for 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 potential military conflict. Uh, thus, we see they uh, more actively and consciously uh, showing up its own vulnerability. Uh, so including uh, diverting economic dependence and uh, um, diverting critical supplies, uh, et cetera. Lastly, um, what the uh, uh, Russia defeat uh, in the Ukraine war would mean for China? Right? Um, uh, let's, Russia's weakening uh, after the Ukraine war is very troubling for China, uh, which is very much domestic uh, oriented. Uh, and so there, there, there are a couple of logic here. Number one, the China, China has never made a holistic mind that they will be the rival uh, ideology of democracy. Right? Um, the, the Russia was, was leading this authoritarian um, uh, coalition and China was just uh, siding with, with Russia. I don't think China collectively is ready to take on this image of being the leader of a rival ideology of the democratic world. So they are not ready to be the direct uh, um, face uh, uh, to compete with uh, advanced uh, democracies in information and technology. And two, uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, now, once China and uh, the US uh, conflict is anticipated in Taiwan, is this issue that militarization uh, is, is, is ongoing. Uh, so Taiwan's situation is much, much uh, less stable now than, than, than before. And, uh, um, and I don't think that China has, has, has a very good strategy in terms of how to, uh, uh, how, how to handle the, the potential fallout over the Taiwan streets. And lastly, the, um, internationally, there are lots of um, security issues in many different places that China is not familiar. Uh, and, and now with Russia's weakening, China will be expected to do more as an inexperienced power. Uh, so, so the Chinese um, uh, actors will feel international environment to be to be riskier than ever. So bottom line, uh, I, I think China will become more self-isolated uh, in the next few years. The vulnerability and a riskier global role that they anticipate. Thanks, man. Well, this is the party school of global studies and there's a lot more to this story than just great power politics and what's going on in this conflict. And of course the global South is not monolithic, but we have Ambassador Heine here to to give a, a view from the South. On, on one level, the South has watched the West vaccinate itself and leave the rest of the world to uh, treat the virus through infection and death. And as the, world, as the West has gone all in on this Ukrainian war, uh, we're largely absent in Pakistan, which is a, a third of the country is underwater right now and in the middle of the financial crisis, in Haiti, which uh, is in even worse shape. 
and because of the, the war, the COVID crisis, and the reckless rising in, of interest rates in the North, now Sub-Saharan Africa is potentially on the verge of another debt crisis, and the West isn't there. As you provocatively tweeted to get people to come to this event yesterday, is this the West versus the rest? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to share uh, my thoughts at, at this great panel. Um, well, let me start by saying the following. The, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a key violation of international law and of UN Charter. Um, it has caused enormous loss of human lives and uh, uh, tremendous suffering. Uh, I myself condemn it thoroughly. And one would expect, given that, that this condemnation would be universal and that everybody would sort of step up to the plate and say, this is bad, we condemn Russia, we all sign together. And to some extent, that is the image we are conveyed if we watch the nightly television news as uh, Professor Gallagher conveyed in his question. Uh, yet that is not the case at all. And you know, a large number of the leading countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America have either taken a studiously neutral role or in uh, some cases, uh, the case of South Africa has uh, stood more or less explicitly with uh, Russia in this. Uh, in Latin America, countries like Brazil, like Mexico, like Argentina, uh, have taken you know, stance you might not expect. The president of Brazil was in Moscow in February and said, I am here in solidarity with Russia. Now, this is quite counterintuitive. So you wonder, what is going on? Why is this? And what I would like to do today is share with you uh, the reasons that, uh, from my perspective, are behind this very counterintuitive, count, quite surprising uh, development. Moreover, because as has been said in the case of China, the commitment to national sovereignty and to self-determination is very important for countries in the developing world. You know, their sovereignty is their treasure, and why would they abide with something like what is going on in? in Ukraine right now. And I would, the first reason I would say is why there has been this uh, reaction is the notion that somehow the war in Ukraine is unique, a very special type of war that does that deserve universal condemnation. The war in Ukraine, of course, is nothing of the sort. You don't have to be obedient like Churchill who famously said that the history of the human race is war to realize that war had been, been going on for a long time that take place in the developing world all the time. Um, let's look at Yemen, eight years, 250,000 dead, largely with weapons supplied by NATO member states to Saudi Arabia. As they already said that Saudi Arabia should be sanctioned, should be taken off the SWIFT system. Nobody said it. President Biden was in Saudi Arabia, but a month ago, two months ago. So the notion that you know, the Ukraine war is so unique doesn't really hold. And that is about you know, a strong reaction in the third world, what used to be called the third world, now the global south, where these wars, again, go on all the time. The second reason, in my judgment, is that this extraordinary attempt to make this into the first truly global war with economic and financial sanctions of an extreme kind, like excluding Russia from the SWIFT banking system, have triggered much pushback. Countries realize that they might be next. So why should you uh, go along with something like this once you start weaponizing the banking system, the financial system, which is a bit like the utility system in the world you know, against countries because NATO deems it so for its geopolitical objectives? Well, you know, serious questions arise as to whether this is a reasonable thing and something that should be uh, accepted. A third reason, I would say, is that there's been a, perceptive, a perception of a shift in the West objectives in the war. At the beginning, it was about defending Ukraine and its territorial integrity and national sovereignty. And you know, nothing wrong with that. This is obviously a very rational and logical thing to do. But by April, it had morphed into something else. It turned into defeating Russia, weakening it permanently, and for some, changing the regime. Now, that, of course, can be a legitimate US foreign, foreign policy objective. But there is no reason why it should be shared by the rest of the world. It is not. 
and thus many of the humanitarian arguments invoked for supporting Ukraine ring hollow. The Western obsession with regime change does not go down well with many well regimes for obvious reasons. Moreover, the history of negative economic sanctions tells us that as a rule, uh, they do not work, especially in the case of authoritarian regimes. It is one thing to provide Ukraine with all the resources it needs, economic, military, and otherwise, to fend off the Russian invasion, the Russian attack. It is another to set as an objective to bring down Russia, weaken it permanently, bring about regime change. Uh, and that is, again, something that not only has effects on Russia, uh, it has effects on, well, the rest of the world. We heard now about what is happening with energy and food prices, the slowing down of the world economy. OECD has just downscaled economic growth projections for the world economy to 3% this year and 2.2% in 2023. Europe has been especially affected. Germany, biggest economy in Europe, will have negative growth of 0.7% next year. And as has been said, Europeans are bracing for a difficult winter. Energy prices are going through the roof. The euro is at an all-time low, trading for the first time lower than the dollar. Lebanon, Suriname, Zambia, Sri Lanka already in default. Countries like Argentina, Ecuador, Kenya, Egypt edging closer to it. Now, you would think that with all these heavy economic sanctions, the Russian economy would be about to fall apart. Well, the ruble is stronger today than it was in February when it traded 84 rubles to the dollar. Today it is at 58 rubles to the dollar. Russia is running a balance of trade surplus of 183 billion this year to August, three times as much as it did in the same period in 2021. So we have this extraordinary situation in which the world economy is teetering on the verge of a recession induced by the war and the sanctions. And Russia is holding up economically quite well. You know, Russian GDP will fall this year, no doubt. But according to some indicators, it is doing quite well. The point I'm trying to make is that all of this creates a very different dynamic from the notion that we heard at the beginning, that this is democracy versus authoritarianism, that that is the main cleavage that the war in Ukraine exposes. Well, when you have India, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Pakistan staying neutral, well, these are some of the biggest democracies in the world. So obviously it cannot be a democracy versus autocracy type of cleavage. In fact, if you count those countries, a majority of the world population is not siding with the West in the issue of the war in Ukraine. And that is why you have this resurrection of non-alignment, non-alignment which most people thought was dead and buried. India at the lead, not calling it that way, but still acting that way. India, which we thought was much closer to the United States. Prime Minister Modi got along famously with President Trump, visited each other. India is a member of the Quad. And yet, when the invasion of Ukraine comes, India said, I'm staying, not only that, I'm buying more and more oil from Russia. So um, what I'm saying is that we are in, in a way, sort of back to the future. Non-alignment is back. And I'm arguing that we are seeing this more and more also in Latin America. And if President Lula is elected on Sunday, I think this will be reaffirmed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if those four interventions aren't uh, sparking any questions, uh, I'm not sure what we're doing wrong here. Uh, I want to open it up uh, to questions, not only from folks in the room, but also those of you who are joining virtually you can go into the Q&A chat box uh, and put in a question. And also, please tell us your name and where you're from so we can try to make it a global conversation. And I'll say that here for, for those of you who are here. Uh, when you raise your hand, uh, tell us your name, where you're from, uh, what program you're at from BU, and so forth. And am I doing that or are you doing that? Uh, Andrew has a, uh, has a microphone, especially so the folks who are joining virtually. So let's uh, let's raise hands and have a conversation. Why don't I take three, two or three, three or four, and then let the panel uh, panel sort of respond uh, in a line. We'll see how many rounds we can do. Question. Kevin, you always have great questions for this kind of exam. Please, Kevin is a very good student of mine. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> good. I thought he was putting me on the spot. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I would like to know more Introduce of- Introduce yourself. Oh, uh, sure. We know your name is Kevin. So, um, hi, my name is Kevin. Um, I'm a student here at the party school. Um, I'm from the US, but half of my family is from Germany as well. So this issue was quite close to my family in this uh, instance. Um, I was just wondering your perspectives on the um, particular European energy crisis on uh, um, on uh, potential remedies that uh, could be formed. Uh, my grandmother, for example, is essentially just not going to be able to pay for heating this winter due to the entire crisis, um, given she's on a pension as well. So um, yeah, this is something facing every German citizen, lots of others in Europe, and I would love to hear what your thoughts on potential remedies would be for that. Great, let's take a couple and then we'll, we'll let the panel respond uh, over here on the right. Uh, hi, I'm Dia. Um, I'm from India. I'm a second year MAIA student here. Um, my question is twofold, and it comes back to the point that Ambassador Heine based on non alignment in India. Um, do you think that neutrality is completely possible with this conflict? Um, I know that Putin and Modi recently met, and there was a call for peace, um, and then they also spoke on their bilateral relations. And if neutrality is possible, should countries like India be given a seat at the table for any possible negotiations that might happen because they have vested interests with the West and with Russia as well? Andrew, let's take the one in the far corner here and then up here in the front row and then we'll go to the panel. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ikram Alif Khan. I'm a student in Pardi. I'm from Indonesia. So I have a question for, for Professor Minye. So my question is tensions in the Taiwan Straits have been uh, long been uh, one of the central plus point in East Asian security. So reflecting to the uh, Russian invasions to Ukraine, do you think is there any serious prospect for armed confrontation over Taiwan in the futures? Mm -hmm. And if there is, uh, why and, or why not? And is there anything that US can do or foreign, pol foreign policy of the US uh, can do to infl uh, influence the outcome. Thank you. One more here in the front row, and then we'll go back to the panel. Oh. No, uh, students first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, boss. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is Lily. I'm originally from New Jersey, um, but my question kind of gears towards the military aspect of it. Um, my question kind of relates to specifically when thinking about Putin and how non-rational he is, what is the point that we're going to see going forwards when the nuclear talks are kind of coming to the table? When is that point of reality kind of going to strike the United States and NATO um, to kind of lead and gear towards that conversation? Thank you. Great question, folks. Let's have everyone on the panel, maybe in the order that we went, try to give a short, sharp, crisp uh, commentary on these so we can uh, so we can do another round. We'll start here. and. Uh, this side of the room didn't talk that much. And we'll also take some of you folks out there in the virtual world. Yeah. Okay, so I got about five points I'm gonna make really quick that answer some of the questions and it's other things I just wanna say, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, number one, the first and foremost thing the United States military needs to do with NATO is to replenish the stocks of all the critical equipment we've already given in Ukraine because we don't know where the next flashpoint is gonna be. And for some of our critical equipment, the stocks are now pretty low. Uh, number two, um, it is really important that you have really tough discussions before you need to have really tough discussions, right? So I gave a talk at the NATO Policy School and the talk was on conventional nuclear integration. Not that the United States wants to fight conventional nuclear integration, but the fact that Vladimir Putin may wanna do that. I won't tell you what nations were not allowed to talk about it, but some said we can't talk about it. Others wanted to talk about it, but it's really sad when you can't even have a discussion about a potential future conflict because it becomes political. I will disagree with my uh, colleague to my left, Putin will not accept defeat. Now, what does that mean? I don't know what it means, but it's, he'll determine success on his terms, not on the way the West terms, but Putin is not gonna have defeat. I'm gonna give you three uses of three nuclear scenarios. So I'm not gonna tell everybody in the room he's not gonna use nuclear weapons. And I'm not gonna tell you that he's going to use nuclear weapons because either way I'm gonna be wrong, right? But I think you have to think about nuclear use in a different context. 
right? Number one, if he does an above ground nuclear test on Russian soil, is that use of a nuclear weapon? I'm gonna give you scenarios that if I was in the Pentagon, I'd have to figure out an answer to. Personally, I think that's a use of a nuclear weapon if you do an above ground nuclear test. The question is, what do you do at that point? The second point, how about if he does a use of a nuclear weapon in territory that he annexes that the international community doesn't recognize, but it doesn't kill anybody? You kill some trees, you kill some grass, but it's a small yield nuclear weapon. It's on Ukrainian territory, but he says it's Russian territory. How do you react? And then the third point is he uses it on the battlefield. I think these are scenarios that you really need to consider. Everybody is rational to a point. Kim Jong-un is a rational player for what he's trying to accomplish on the peninsula for himself. Putin, if I don't agree with him, but I can explain to you why he thinks that Ukraine is part of their territory and the whole bit, right? I think the bottom line when it comes to the use of a nuclear weapon is you need to consider other uses of a nuclear weapon that we don't consider a use of a nuclear weapon and what are we going to do about it? Because the whole discussion when we talk about nuclear deterrence is we are willing, the United States is willing to trade LA for Seoul. Do you believe that? And then the final item is, I think China and India have a huge role here. Nobody, regardless of politics or international academic discussions, no one should tolerate the use of a nuclear weapon or the threat of using a nuclear weapon. And I think there is an obligation that China has and India has to tell Vladimir Putin they will not tolerate any use of a nuclear weapon that the friendship that may have, by the way, Modi did push back now against um, Vladimir Putin. I think these are items that need to happen in the international community, but I need, if it's actually gonna prevent something from going over, India and China need to stand up to what I consider is a very dangerous person right now. Thanks. Do we go in Please, sequence uh, or yeah, maybe? Well, let's go with the green. Oh, I'm sorry, green team. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks, Kevin, for that question. Um, this gets, I get to sneak in my a little commentary about what the nature of the energy crisis is then in terms of answering what solutions would be. The solutions would be super easy. There could be a solution tomorrow. Um, all six, well, five out of six of Germany's nuclear plants uh, could be put back online within days and they have enough fuel to keep going, they'd have to reorder, but it could all happen. But bureaucracies in Germany are currently going through the motion of shutting those plants down. And the question is why? Why would they shut down in the first place? Why, is, why tomorrow are the plants not being put on? Also, I'm talking about Germany's nuclear reactors, but it's a European energy market. So it would change the price of energy all across the EU if Germany did that tomorrow. So there actually isn't really a crisis. Uh, it, the crisis is political. And there are political reasons why this happened. And there are political reasons why people are saying it's impossible to fix or it's difficult to fix. Also, yeah, I think about this personally too. Um, my only solution is to bring my aunt who's on a pension to Boston um, so she doesn't uh, freeze in her apartment this winter. And I'm thinking about it, I'm not kidding around. Um, I have a small guest room. Um, so the, the thing is, why do I say it's political, the choice to have uh, Europe, that Europe got itself in this situation? Um, by political, I mean ideological. By political, I mean corruption of individuals um, and elites. And I also mean electoral. So ideologically, Germany decided to have a transition to green energy, but it decided to have natural gas be its bridge technology. Um, and, uh, but it, there was no strategy for moving towards green energy. They basically outsourced it to the market. That is why there are no big energy storage reserves in, in, in Germany right now, because it was all outsourced to market logic. It was not state industrial policy. It was not driven with a security and a national interest frame. Um, when I say corruption, I mean that also in addition to outsourcing it to the market, 
uh, the idea of binding, because Germany is the one that matters here about energy, even though the, the markets are European, the fates of everyone are together, but Germany was the one that made the decision and is continuing to make the decisions that got Europe there. So when I say corruption, elites in Germany teamed up with uh, state-based actors and organized crime adjacent actors in, in Russia to intentionally create a project that would bind Europe to Russia in this interdependence way. And it was intended to bring the fate of Germany together closer and bind it in a way to Russia that would be hard for it to move away. So I'm talking about people like Gerhard Schroeder and people like that and others. Intentionally, they did it, you know, but they also intentionally, there's a lot of historical record that say they did it in order to bind these states closer together so that U-turns couldn't happen in terms of the fates. And also by political, I mean electoral. The reason why Germany took its nuclear plants offline in 2011 was because of the Fukushima crisis. But it wasn't just because of the Fukushima crisis. It's because the German Green Party, I'm the green team here, the German Green Party was facing uh, down, breathing down Angela Merkel's neck in a regional election and was gonna knock her party out of power in 2011. So she triangulated, she moved to the left to take away their heat and took their agenda away from them, which was to take off, take down nuclear energy. And that is the same reason today why nuclear plants are not being turned back on because of the threat of a third party in Germany, which is very strong, the Greens, who are against nuclear energy. Um, and so I'm not trying to throw the Greens under the bus or anything. I'm just making a comment about how these European democracies are democracies, and they're some of the most reactive and responsive to public, public opinion democracies that are on this earth in that they are parliamentary systems, most of them, and they face a lot. They basically um, uh, are very reactive and responsive to public opinion. So yeah, Germany could turn its, its nuclear power plants on tomorrow. It may. Its parties will probably lose power, and we'll see what happens next. And I can, somebody can ask me a question about what that means for the EU or not. <laughs> ben. Okay, well, thanks to the question from our Indonesian students. I'm sure the Taiwan question uh, is really on the minds of Asianist. Uh, the or the so-called Asia century really hinges on the Taiwan situation. So Taiwan's status quo, in a way, and peace and prosperity was really um, great accomplishment of very smart diplomacy, right? Uh, it, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a China civil war and separated the territory since 1949. And 1972, uh, the, um, uh, the PRC took over the international standing uh, of, uh, of, of, of China. And, uh, and since then, despite uh, despite uh, this historical roots, the, the two sides was able to trade intensely. Uh, so both, so we, we think of Taiwan and mainland are enemies, but in the, the social aspects, economic uh, interdependence is very, very deep. So, so we all like China specialists or Asianists, for many years, we, we do see Americans policy over Taiwan as this embodiment of really, really smart strategy. And that was um, strategic ambiguity uh, and a one China policy, right? So uh, the current, uh, it, it's been uh, six, five, uh, it, it, it's been five, six years. Um, the, the Taiwan, uh, American Taiwan policy has been shifting. And uh, the Chinese call it salami um, slicing. So the one China policy is uh, increasingly untenable. You, know, salami you don't know when this will be gone and the status quo will be gone. But they, 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 they saw step by step, step by step that it's uh, the one the China policy is signaling, signaling. Uh, yet, uh, and then uh, uh, so, 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 but so the Ukraine implication was the, the, China, the Beijing's uh, strategists believe this is American's way you know, uh, to um, entice uh, China into premature military um, uh, uh, takeover. 
Um, uh, this, this works in two ways. One is it makes China more careful, right? Because now they, they pretty much believed, like a couple of years ago, the debate was if the military in, invade um, uh, Taiwan, like it took, uh, military took over, uh, take over Taiwan, will the US uh, um, uh, military intervene, right? And now there's no question about that. So any military takeover of Taiwan, when that decision is made, China needs to be sure that they can not only fight America, but also Japanese um, uh, alliance and, and American alliance in the Pacific um, uh, Asia. So the stake is much higher. The threshold of, of takeover is higher, but the status quo is also becoming much, much more unstable. So there are a couple uh, trends I think is very uh, uh, dangerous in the region. Uh, Taiwan is talking about they are being Ukrainized. Uh, uh, for example, the current um, uh, Taiwan Policy Act and before the Policy Act, uh, American military aid and weapons uh, uh, um, transfer uh, to Taiwan uh, is preparing uh, Taiwan to be the next uh, 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 street battles against um, uh, a Chinese force in the case of Chinese. So, so it's preparing for, for that. So try and make Taiwan as the, the strategy is called the porcupine strategy. <laughs> uh, so making Taiwan as, as, as harmful as, as possible rather than, than preventing the outbreak of war. At least the Chinese strategist was uh, uh, think, thinking of that. And then the um, uh, the, the nuclear dimension now it's again very uh, unstable and there are different ways to go, uh, but, but clearly uh, Japan is, um, uh, it, it, uh, the Japan's nuclear policy will change uh, and what types of nu nuclearization uh, takes place, well, we don't know. Um, so it's a very, very dangerous, but I'm, I, I think the th threshold of military um, takeover will be higher, uh, but if there is very clear declaration, because the Chinese, um, they, have, they, they announced the red lines for, for military in, uh, to, uh, force, for, uh, forceful uh, inva uh, invasion, right? And, and that, that red line so far, is not crossed, uh, but the slimy slicing, uh, tactic is also intensifying this, 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 this militarization. So I think we will live in this very kind of live dangerously in the Asia century. Actually, I want to make comment on India. I think India um, and China can play very big a part, but the Chinese still think America is not ready to, to, to negotiate. Uh, and another point on the neutrality, this, because this comes up, I, I don't think neutrality is a good term to describe a third global South uh, uh, policy. Neutrality, I mean, I'm not uh, an English native speaker, but to me, neutrality is that you don't care, but it's not. It's just for, um, for, for third countries. Your, your choices, your, dom your domestic priorities, they are, they are, in, they are, they are, they are contradictory. Right, so, so international on particular issue, you, you can't take a one view, but it's not neutrality. Actually, different groups in India, different groups in Brazil, in China cared immensely about the situation. But as a whole, you can't take a one clean shot positioning. That's right. Okay, yes. Let me deal first with the conceptual issue, and then I'll home in on the, the case of India. Yes, neutrality, uh, I fully agree with uh, mm -hmm. my colleague. Neutrality is different from non-alignment. Uh, neutrality is what Switzerland was at one point, not part of the EU, not even part of the UN. You basically don't say anything about what happens in the world. Non-alignment means you do not take an automatic stance either with Washington or with Moscow in its day or today uh, either with Washington or with Beijing. Uh, you know, it's variable geometry. On some issues, you may be closer to the US. On others, you may be closer to China, say. So it, I would distinguish 
neutrality from alignment. Now, the case of India, I think, is particularly interesting because I always thought that the notion that somehow uh, the US could rely on India to balance China was quite wrong headed. India is too big. Prime Minister Modi comes to the US. Mr. Trump goes to Ahmedabad and is received in a big stadium named Narendra Modi Stadium, believe it or not. Uh, but that doesn't mean that India will automatically align with the United States. It is a part of the Quad, it plays a role in the Indo-Pacific. But when things like the invasion of Ukraine happen, it takes its own uh, stance. Interestingly enough, Mr. Modi doesn't call it non-alignment because that is too closely identified with Mr. Nehru, whom you know, he doesn't like. But he talks about uh, strategic uh, autonomy, you know, which is what the Europeans uh, refer to at some point. Macron and the Spaniards have talked about strategic autonomy, which hasn't held up very well in the case of Europe now you know, with, the, with the war. Uh, the, point, the broader point I would like to make is that uh, we see now in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, a resurgence of non-alignment uh, in a, what I've called the second Cold War that is happening between the United States and China. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Thanks. I'm looking to our uh, coordinator here to see if we have time or we're supposed to stop at one. Can we, can we have a couple more questions or are we? Yeah, so we are over time. Questions coming in from the live stream, but just want to get lightning responses from our panelists here. Uh, one from Maggie, party student, class of 24. Um, what is the best approach for the international community to take towards mm. Russia post conflict? How does this differ between the global north and the south? And then we also have one coming in from Sistani, class of 2024. Uh, what about the USMC policy approach so far as the conflict? Would it uh, request more action? My only comment is how to treat Russia post-conflict. I don't think Putin can be there from a U.S. perspective. I don't know how you mm. you get a repaired relationship with Russia as long as Putin is there mm -hmm. um, personally. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, what was, I kind of missed uh, that. It was, how about the USNC policy approach so far uh, related to conflict? NC? NC, what's NC? US, UN, UN, National UN? Security Council. The Security oh, Council. Oh, yeah. oh. oh, okay. Okay, well, I, Okay, this is coming from my military experience. I see no value in what the UN is doing. It's nice what they're doing, but as long as uh, Russia can veto uh, any security resolution that happens, I think they lose uh, uh, credibility on what they're doing. He's annexing part of a nation. I, I guarantee you that's the way it's gonna go. And whatever the UN does, the Security Council is gonna vote uh, and he's gonna vote against it. So I see the validity of the UN losing power in this, con losing uh, validity uh, based on this invasion. Mm -hmm. Any other quick reactions to that? Yes, yes. I would say on the question of, you know, what to do with Russia afterwards, I have a somewhat different uh, take. It seems to me a big problem in uh, Western policy so far is this obsession with regime change. All the time it's about el malo, you know, you identify the real bad guy and then go after him. Politics is a lot more complicated than that. And it seems to me it's important to leave doors open, alternative. Uh, otherwise, things can get a lot more complicated. Yeah, so uh, I'll be very quick uh, in terms of China. Uh, they, uh, they like UN Security Council with expanded uh, members. They're now the Brazil, India, Japan. Uh, Germany don't try to do much, but the other four actually uh, are very frequent uh, or uh, non-permanent security members. So if they are expanded UN Security Council uh, uh, conversation, China would allow that. Uh, second is uh, 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 the, the Chinese uh, uh, don't think they are part to one side of the war, so they still think that their relationship with Ukraine uh, is, uh, is, is, is uh, relatively stable. So if it's a post-war construction, uh, Chinese builders, financiers um, uh, will, be, will be very eager to go back.
I wanted to sneak in an answer to Professor Gallagher's question he posed to me and also Professor, mm -hmm. my colleague, Professor Heine's comment that European strategic autonomy hasn't worked out. I just want to say that um, conceptually, the European Union's actually only gotten stronger after crises, um, including Brexit, including the 2014 security crisis of Russia and um, invasion of Crimea. And at this moment in time, the EU itself, the EU itself, the executive offices in Brussels, not a collection of countries making decisions together by un unanimity, but the EU itself is the third largest contributor of military equipment to Ukraine behind the US and the UK in front of Germany and France. So that was my rebuttal to that. Hey, Kevin, can I make one positive comment? I mean, really positive comment? This is a great discussion with a differing of, of views that you're hearing. Uh, some of the countries we have talked about today in other countries could not have the same discussion. So as you talk about the values and what the US may have done poorly and what the United States needs to do or the West has failed to do, please understand that at least we're able to have this discussion having a difference of opinion. You can't have this difference of opinion in other countries. Well, that's what I was gonna segue into that, uh, that this discussion isn't ending, right? This is the beginning of the semester. And we just wanted to kick this off. This is the kind of things you can talk about in your classrooms, talk about outside, talk about here. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of great events uh, here at the party school over the course of the semester. Uh, hope you're on our, our, our newsletters and, um, and go to our website and you can look at events. Actually, for those of you uh, virtually and here in person who are, who are Boston and BU, uh, we can continue these kinds of conversations this afternoon at 4 p.m. The party center for the study of the longer range future is having its open house. They're going to be talking about what the what programs they have over the course of the year. We'll hear some remarks from from Dean Taylor, and uh, you're all invited to that. That's 67 Bay State Road. See everyone later. Thanks so much for coming, and thanks to the panelists. What was you saying?